de braço e de só um pouco. Braço. Again and again, I think the best thing that can be done and should be done is to implement the agreement on Gaza and Jericho. This will demonstrate what a deep change can occur. Residents of Diaperville, a small community on the Bad River Reservation just south of Ashland, are being told don't drink the water. The Wisconsin National Guard is bringing in tanks of fresh water for about 25 residents. It's feared there may be dangerous levels of contaminants. Residents like Marie Chidsey, who has lived here for 50 years, are worried and mad. What really bothers me was we have been asking is this water safe? And we were told that it was. The contamination is believed to have come from this disposal site, which sits next to the reservation on Ashland County land. During the 1960s and 70s, the American Can Company dumped de-inking sludge from a paper mill here. And now, 20 years later, there are problems. It's going to be a long-term environmental problem, regardless of what action is taken here in the next couple of weeks. Um, we may see permanent destruction of some resources for the tribe, which uh, are invaluable. In fact, there may have already been a loss of life. That loss of life Anderson referred to is Julie Lemieux. She lived next to the disposal site. When she was diagnosed with chemically induced liver problems, her grandson, Bill Kolajewski, became suspicious. The doctor diagnosed her as having a chemically induced liver cirrhosis. Um, at that point, the doctor questioned where this could come from as she had no history of any using alcohol. As Bill researched the disposal site, he started to find evidence of contamination. In 1988, the Environmental Protection Agency reviewed chemical analysis of the sludge and determined there was no need for further action. But enter the Environmental Research Foundation, an independent research lab. They analyzed data from the reservation and determined there was indeed reason for concern. One well tested yielded high levels of cadmium, a chemical that causes liver problems. For now, the residents will continue to drink water supplied from the National Guard as more tests are conducted. Although many fear they've already been exposed, they want the situation rectified as soon as possible. On the Bad River Reservation, Ted Rowlands News 6. company. Most companies are for focusing on growing and going forward. They never think about the, the uh, impact of going backwards. Tom Hansen is manager of operations at Reach All in Duluth. He knows about employee layoffs. 
Reach all has gone from 200 to 100 workers. Call it downsizing or right sizing, whatever you choose, people got laid off. In recent years, we've seen the mining industry lay off thousands. Hospitals have even reduced their staffs. Other industries have been forced to cut back to keep corporate profit levels in the black. Today, Hansen was explaining to these training and development leaders the importance of having a plan to cope with layoffs and how to deal with the workers who remain on the job. There has to be a level of understanding from managers and that on the productivity issues. Uh, otherwise, it just adds stress to the overall level of the organization, um, not to approach it with a, a whip and chain type of an atmosphere, but understanding, trying to get them help. Including a loss in productivity, Hansen says there are six main reasons for concern among companies laying off workers. Increased frustration, a loss of established friendships, an increase in discrimination cases, more attention to work rules in a union shop, and a fear known as the am I next syndrome. Generally speaking, for every 10 to 20 percent reduction in workforce, you're going to see 1 to 2 percent of the workforce leave in what I call fright and flight over the downsizing that's going on. And normally, those are the individuals that are highly skilled and usually younger individuals. What the bridge will offer the motorists are two 12-foot wide driving lanes on each side, an 8-foot wide shoulder on each side, and an inside shoulder on each side of 3 feet. So the bridge will be significantly wider. The area lift bridge is one of the most visual landmarks in Duluth and one of the most visited tourist areas. But it's more than just an attraction. It's the gateway to the Twin Ports Harbor. Last year, the bridge suffered some serious electrical and mechanical problems, eventually causing it to grind to a halt on November 22nd. Officials had no idea how long it would take to fix the bridge. The bridge operators told me anywhere from a couple hours to a couple of days. Many Park Point residents feared they would be stuck without access to their homes. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. In a hotel uh, I'll, maybe I'll have to stay with some friends or see if somebody will pull me up. After spending many hours on repairs and bringing in experts from New Jersey and Pennsylvania, bridge operators say its problems are finally solved. Uh, there are recommendations for improvements, uh, which, which are not all that uh, uh, major. Uh, we'll have the uh, bridge uh, controls uh, operating the way we want them, and uh, the bridge will be operating uh, uh, as it has in the last uh, 60 years. Uh, keeping the uh, ships going in and out of the port. But there will be some changes in the way the bridge is operated from now on. It was high winds that knocked the bridge off its tracks last November, and cold weather lifts have also caused problems for the structure. So the new instructions are to slow down during bad weather. Operators will lift the structure at half speed during those days, making no difference to vessels, but holding up traffic for longer periods of time. Spokesmen say it may be a little inconvenient, but it's worth it to avoid further problems with the bridge. On the waterfront in Duluth, Barbara Riles, News 6.
goal of this event is to raise the awareness of youth that they have some decisions that can affect their health. I vowed at that time that we're going to put the state on long-term planning, we're going to get back our AAA bond rating, we're going to have plans that go out on the operating side of our budget for four years, and on the debt side, some six years, we've done that. <clears throat> we are now ranked third in America in financial management. gives the state permission to issue bonds to help Northwest Burb. You know, I think the balloon was popped a long time ago, and I think people have slowly come down to the reality that that maybe originally, uh, you know, it was more than anybody could have ever expected in, in light of the airline industry and what they've been going through. So, uh, you know, people have said to me, you know, it's we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket anyway. So with the, the present uh, proposal, I think we're going to come out quite well. If things go smoothly and the interest is there, the Minnesota State High School Hockey Tournament could have a girls' version as soon as next February. Girls playing hockey is nothing new. Duluth's Shauna Davidson is competing for a third time at the World Championships as part of the United States women's hockey team. Shauna grew up playing in the Duluth Amateur Hockey Association alongside the boys. But before Davidson or any other girls, there was Jean Ronnegan, now Jean uh, Kronzner, brother, mother of two, the with a third on the we way. She the paved the way for girls to play youth hockey in Duluth. In 1972, Jean decided to join her brothers and sign up for the Cogden Park team. I, mean, I, I think it's only fair that if there's not something available for the girls that they should be able to do um, do whatever the boys are doing too. And we were little kids and, you know, we were barely skating. I can remember not being able to see over these boards. Not everyone welcomed Gene to the boys' sport of hockey. It was big news. The president of the league wanted Gene out, saying it was a boys' league. Others pointed out that it just wasn't ladylike. After all, an injury to the face could spell big trouble to a girl, or appearance was everything. Gene's father, mothers. Bob Ronigan, was uh, behind his daughter 100%. Some of the mothers right over on that, uh, off those boards there, scream some very, very unhappy things. <laughs> Which I thought was just amazing, you know, for little kids playing. But uh, that's the only people that I heard besides the uh, league. The league quickly changed their tune when Bob brought up the fact that forbidding Gene to play was against the law. The following year, Gene was joined by three more girls. And since then, girls have been a visible part of hockey in Duluth and around the Northland. Gene was fortunate in, uh, or in, in that I was a lawyer and I knew the law. As was Shauna and all the other girls who have followed Gene onto the ice rink. In Duluth, Ted Rollins, News 6.
if there's someone out there that's having a hard time dealing with this situation and we would like for them to get help as soon as possible and be able to air their problems and so we can come together as a community. Last night in Duluth, the group called a violence-free Duluth opened a special crisis support center. The group wanted area residents to have somewhere to go to talk about yesterday's triple homicide. Close to 75 people attended last night's gathering, many wondering what has happened to this small town of Duluth. This isn't Chicago, this isn't Minneapolis, this is Duluth. I was born here, I was raised here. We are people here, we are a small town. And to have this come to a town this size is terrible. Meanwhile, the much smaller town of Proctor was coping with the realization that Todd Warren won't be back at school when spring break comes to an end next week. The Proctor Community Center was open this afternoon for students to come and talk about the incident. They don't understand how Todd seemed to be pushed to that degree that he would uh, take upon himself uh, to do something like that. Uh, which I think tells us there, there's a lot of stuff we don't know yet and we need to be cautious about assuming anything about personalities or you know, motivations or anything like that. Proctor students have been told to be cautious about possible retaliation until emotions surrounding yesterday's killings subside. In Duluth, Ted Rowlands, News 6. For these sorts of charges to come up regarding this family not only shocks me, but shocks literally dozens of uh, mutual friends that I've talked to already, and I'm sure probably hundreds. Uh, they were just pillars of the Proctor community. Everybody liked them. Everybody knew them. Attorney Doug Merritt grew up with Todd Warren's parents. He has seen firsthand their shock. He says the real motive behind Todd Warren's actions were the alleged rape of his girlfriend and another girl at the party and that the shooting was committed in the heat of passion. Certainly, um, Todd's defense uh, is going to be affected by the legitimacy of the accusations that uh, one or more girls were raped at this party. And uh, I guess it's curious that the police are anxious to release information regarding a murder case, uh, yet uh, are closed-mouthed with the media about the other side of the case. Well, there's a lot of discussion on, on workers' compensation, and I would report that that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is it's an extremely difficult issue uh, to move through the legislature, although uh, we hope uh, if uh, Minnesota businesses continue the kind of pressure on their legislators that they have in the past three months, in the next month, that we have a chance. The healing process is taking a long time. Last Monday's triple homicide has violently shocked the Northland into a realization that there are problems here. Serious problems that many used to think could only happen in the big cities. That this is, in a sense, a wake-up call to us to say, um, let's work really hard as a community to make sure it doesn't happen again. Every one who was part of the tragedy really is a victim of it. Investigators arrested a second 18-year-old connected with the triple homicide, Douglas Towell of Rice Lake. Towell was taken into custody last night on a felony conspiracy charge. He was initially detained during Monday's arrest of Todd Warren, the young Proctor High School student who's charged with the three counts of second-degree murder. Sources have told News 6 that since the shootings, officials here at Proctor High have been holding meetings discussing how to help students cope with the tragedy. Central High has been doing the same. School resumes on Monday. We really do have to tell our children, um, talk about what happened and talk about it in very non-judgmental ways. We have to talk about violence as not acceptable and, and there being no 
excuses for it. This afternoon, funeral services for one of Monday's victims, 21-year-old Sam Witherspoon. Both Witherspoon and Peter Moore were buried today. The third victim, Keith Hermanson, was buried yesterday. In Duluth, Chip Wallace, News 6. The stabber tells us that this man was apparently, he felt was going to try to take something out of the apartment. He challenged him on this issue, and then an altercation occurred over this, according to the stabber, and that he ended up stabbing Mr. Kilby. Is there anything that you hold back? I try not to talk about things that people ask me not to talk about. But when people talk about what's wrong, maybe somebody else out there will open up that maybe someone else will say, well, if Barbara can do it, so can I. Or if she can get help, so can I. Just because you're fat doesn't mean that you can't be sexy and gorgeous. I would say three to five minutes and probably no longer uh, when I seen him there I dove down and grabbed him and brought him up we got him on the side of the pool I climbed out uh, I assessed his vital signs and uh, there were none uh, present so I uh, immediately started CPR
wipe it off so at least it looks clean. This is the only jewelry cleaner that comes with a metal polish. It's non-abrasive. It will not scar or damage your jewelry in any way. Just take a clean cloth or a paper towel and rub it. Okay, let's lay the right one in there. Okay, now if you'll slip your foot back in there, cushioning and massaging is what you'll be doing. Now, what you are feeling is that liquid gel inside, of course, moving back and forth, massaging the bottom of your foot. It's an IRA account rush at the Dreyfus Financial Center. And among those investigating investments are clients a long way off from their golden years. Linda Kira, age 27, has opened an IRA. I don't see the Social Security being around. Um, pension is not going to be around, definitely. Um, so even though I'm fairly young, I still want to invest now. Young Americans are planning ahead. A new survey from the Employee Benefit Retirement Institute finds that so-called Generation X begins to save for retirement at a median age of 23, while those aged 35 to 55 began retirement savings at a median age of 30, and Americans over 55 started saving at a median age of 42. You won't necessarily use it for retirement purposes, but you'll always have that just in case you ever needed it. This attitude from a generation that is widely believed to fear it will be worse off than its predecessors. But that won't be the case if they keep saving. Workers today are better off. They have higher real incomes and they have a greater store of wealth. So what we see is a lot of what is a popular perception is to some degree flawed. Experts say one reason Americans are saving younger is all the media attention given to retirement accounts. But are we saving enough? The median amount that Americans say they need to tuck away by the time they retire is $150,000. Some retirement experts say that's not enough for the average American. And not all young Americans are bothering with retirement planning. It's important, yeah, it's like going to the dentist is important, but you, know, you, don't, you don't think about it until your tooth hurts. For NBC News, Alan Chernoff, New York. To be honest with you, I think the man just looked on us. Yeah, they had a special deal of a TV and a VCR. He was a very smooth talker, uh, very personable. This looks and sounds like a good deal. He looks like an honest person. Why not go ahead and do it? I feel foolish, yes. Yeah, His whole purpose was to try to get me to sign a contract that day. I couldn't understand how I could be a victim. Several years ago, News 4 producer Murray Schweitzer took a job as an in-home salesperson and has been fascinated by the world of the hard sell ever since. That's right, Liz. You know what the in-home salesperson does is called closing on the final objection. And when it's done right, people are almost helpless to do anything but sign the contract, even if they don't want what's being sold. So what happens next? Well, the first thing the salesman does is make an appointment when husband and wife are going to be home. And for our demonstration, that's what I've done. So I probably should get in there because I know they're expecting me. Okay. Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I'm Murray Schweitzer with Crenshaw Timeshares Incorporated. If you've ever answered a postage paid card for information or said OK to a telephone solicitor, you can expect a hard sell visit. In our demonstration, the Smiths have done what all of us do. They've sat the salesman in their living room and they're waiting to hear his information. 
but the hard seller is not ready to sell just yet. Could I ask a favor? I would love a cup of coffee. Would that be too much of an interview? No problem. How do you take That's because uh, once the Smiths have served the salesman, oh, yeah. he oh, becomes more so like much. a friend. A friend whose goal is to oh, move out of the right. Smiths' formal this living room. I have a whole lot to tell you tonight, and I'm, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I, I need to ask you a favor. Could we move into your dining room? I have a lot of materials in here. I need to spread them out, and I need some room. Sure. Yeah, no problem at all. Good. Yeah. By getting the Smiths to their dining room... Mrs. Smith, would you sit in that chair for me right there? And, and Mr. Smith, would you sit here? The salesman begins to take more control. Watch how he positions the Smiths very carefully at the table so he can watch both and they can't signal each other without him seeing it. The salesman also uses his pen as a pointer. That's so later on when it's time to sign the contract, it'll be right there and there's no time wasted. For our demonstration, Murray is selling vacations in a timeshare resort. He begins his pitch with a pitch book. And at a key moment in the hard sell, he tells the Smiths he expects a decision tonight. Let's listen. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to explain the program to you fully. I'm going to answer all your questions. And then I'm going to ask you tonight whether you want to join and buy a membership or whether you want to pass the opportunity on to one of your neighbors. Now, does that sound fair to you, Mr. Smith? Yeah. And does that sound fair to you, Mrs. Smith? Sure. Good, okay. It's important that the salesman gets the Smiths to agree. Then later, they can't use the excuse that they want to think about it for a few days. Few people buy if they think about it. Which brings us to the three F principle. Using the words feel, felt, and found, the salesman turns around objections. For instance, let's suppose the Smiths are hesitant to decide tonight. The hard seller moves in with the three Fs. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I know how you feel. Others felt the same way too, but you know what they found? They found that decisions made on first impressions were usually the best decisions for them. Don't you feel that way too? Yeah, I, I guess so. For the most um, part, sure. See them agree? He's got them. And the 3F principle will be used again and again to clear objections. Murray also uses this time to collect information to be used later. What do you spend on an average vacation? I don't know. $2,000? I don't know. I think Two, that's probably about right. maybe. Yeah. The Smiths say they spend a few thousand dollars on a vacation. When it comes time to ask for the money, Murray can remind them that his vacation plan is a lot cheaper than theirs. So the hard sell continues along, moving always towards the eventual goal, the close. Would you then approve that right here, Mr. Smith, you underneath? Elizabeth Crenshaw for NBC News. Yes, we drove up in front of our house with the company name on the truck, and everything appeared to be pretty much in order in the truck. Hey, well, let's put it this way. Every time she mentioned something, or I mentioned something, she had something to add to it. A um, nice, presentable young man came to the door. Uh, sat down and started talking about his company. Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Hi. I'm Murray Schweitzer with Hi. Crenshaw Timeshares. Yesterday, we showed you how the hard sell game is played. Oh, News 4 producer Murray Schweitzer, who at one time sold in home, has been studying the hard sell. He showed us yesterday how he got his foot in the door of this couple's home. During the presentation, he asked lots of questions and got answers that would allow him to clear objections later on. What do you normally spend on a vacation? I, what? Oh, maybe a couple thousand? Yeah, maybe two thousand. He also told the Smiths he wanted a yes or no decision that night, and he's gotten them to agree. Does that sound fair to you, Mr. Smith? Yeah, I suppose so. And, and does that sound fair to you, Mrs. Smith? Sure. Do, uh, do you Murray's like been with the Smiths for about an hour now. He's eliminated possible objections all along the way and, of course, made the timeshare vacation sound like Shangri-La. Now it's time to close, to get the Smiths to sign the contract. Physically, the contract has been on the table all the time, carefully hidden under a stack of other papers. Now it's revealed. Now, I want to show you what this is going to look like on paper. Well, I'm not so sure we're ready for, I, and I don't know that we're ready for this stage. Mr. Smith is nervous now. He knows money time has arrived, and he doesn't want that contract filled out. But Murray is ready with a sales tactic called the 3F principle. Using the words feel, felt, and found, Murray is going to turn around any objection. You know, Mr. Smith, I know how you feel. 
Others felt the same way too, but you know what they found? They found when they saw it all detailed on paper, made the decision for them very simple. Don't you, don't you feel that way too? Murray is quickly right filling in information top. now, and but not allowing the Smiths to see the contract quite yet. As Murray fills in the contract, he turns up the pressure. I think you're going to like these numbers, though. Let me just write them down. I think you'll like them. Mr. Smith's mind is now racing as the contract is completed. He's desperately searching for a reason not to buy. Finally, Mr. Smith comes up with a strong objection that he thinks will get there. him off the hook. But I'm particularly concerned about my work. I, I'm, I'm relocated from time to time. I'm transferred from, from, you know, I could be here. I could be in Denver. Murray's got just, him now. So sure Here's the hard sell close. Okay, let me get this straight. You like the program? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think yeah. we're. And the only reason you're not going to join tonight is because you could be transferred, and then maybe the membership wouldn't work out. That's well, well, let me write down here that this membership is void if you're transferred more than 200 miles. Would you put your name down there, please? You underneath. Murray closed them on the final objection. What could the Smiths do? They told the salesman three times the only reason they weren't buying tonight was their fear of being transferred, and the salesman cleared the objection. At this point, the Smiths would have to admit they lied. Let's see another close. This time, let's pretend the Smiths are an older couple, afraid to sign tonight because Mr. Smith is up in years. So the only reason you're not going to join tonight is the fact that something could happen to you and then she would be stuck with the membership? Yes. yes. Well, let me write down here that this membership is void upon proof of your death. Would you sign there, Mr. Smith, you underneath? Devastating. The Smiths stated one final objection, you know the salesman cleared it away, and now the Smiths own something they never wanted. Hi. You won't believe this guy. He's been here for over an hour. He's trying to sell us timeshares. I, I just can't get rid of him. I don't know what to do. Elizabeth Crenshaw for NBC News. If they say that you have to buy on the spot, the best thing for you to do is thank them for the time and tell them goodbye. That's to give up any money until they see the product or try the product uh, first. Never ever sign anything the first time you meet them. Let me ask you a question. Do, uh, do you like golf? Not a huge golfer, but I do enjoy windsurfing and we oh, play a fair amount of tennis. Water sports are great. Do you like golf? What do you, what do you enjoy? Tennis, water skiing. Yeah, the, you're going to find the weather is perfect for play. It's never too hot. It's always just wonderful. News 4 producer Murray Schweitzer has been studying the hard sell. He has shown us how salesmen make an appointment with you and then pitch a product or service during an intense psychological game where the pressure can be brutal. I think you're going to like these numbers when I get them down on paper. When it comes time to sign the contract, many people are looking for a way out, a way to say no to what's being sold. But that's exactly what the salesman wants. He wants to close you on one final objection. Well, I guess we do have, uh, I mean, there are a couple concerns, but I'm particularly concerned about my work. I, I'm, I'm relocated from time to time. I'm transferred from, from, you know, I could be here. I could be in Denver. Let me get this straight. You like the program? Yeah, and, and, and the thing that's got you a little worried is that you could be transferred and then maybe the timeshare wouldn't be so good for you. Well, yeah, and I think that's a serious... And the only thing that's preventing you from signing tonight is the fact that you could get transferred and then you'd be stuck with the timeshare? That's a big problem. Well, let me write down here that this membership is void if you're transferred more than 200 miles. I'll tell you what. Would you sign here, Mr. Smith? You underneath? The Smiths told Murray the one final reason they wouldn't buy, and Murray cleared that objection Contest. away and closed them. So how do you protect so yourself? First, like, you have to realize when you're involved in a direct in-home hard sell situation. Well, Understand that you're never being simply introduced to a product or receiving free information. People, people so come to your home to sell you something. You have to break the salesman's psychological hold. Hi. You won't believe this guy. He's been Arrange to have a friend call on the phone or leave the room to make a call yourself. Then decide if you want what's being sold. Also, use objections that are impossible for a salesman to turn around. I want to show this contract to my lawyer. I'm going to check you out with the Consumer Affairs Agency. Before I sign a contract, I'd like to see some referral letters. 
it's virtually impossible to close on those objections. And finally, we're just not interested. I think. Thank I don't you. think. You know, I don't I think, think so. Thank, thank you for coming. Really, though. we could really nice talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Elizabeth Crenshaw for NBC News. In his closing arguments, J. Patrick O'Neill gave it his all, trying to persuade the jury that his client, Jamie Jardine, is not guilty of murder or rape. The public defender showed a videotape depicting what it looks like inside Katie's massage parlor, indicating that sex may regularly take place. Mr. Jardine does not make sense. Mr. Jardine is not reasonable in his recollection of the facts from November 7th. District Attorney Dan Blank told the jury the evidence was overwhelming and that Jardine is a violent homicidal rapist. He said there is one word they need to know, and that word starts with G and ends with Y. Guilty. The bottom line is the defendant's lying and the victim is not. The bottom line is the defendant showed you on several occasions during this trial his consciousness of guilt. The victim has shown you that she could be damaged for life. During the final arguments, the defendant, Jamie Jardine, sat quietly listening, not showing much emotion. $203 million. That's how much Michael Eisner, chief executive of the Walt Disney Company, took home last year. In fact, it's nearly four times what the second highest paid CEO earned, Sanford Weil of Travelers Corporation, at $53 million. But Eisner's salary alone was actually below average for top CEOs, just three quarters of a million. Virtually all of his earnings came from cashing in stock options that had soared in value since the mid-80s. It was the result of creating billions upon billions in new value from a company that was literally flat on its back. In other words, it was performance-related pay, and that's now the trend in executive compensation. Compensation committees are, are taking their responsibilities uh, increasingly to heart in terms of looking at that relationship between executive pay and the performance of the company. Though the numbers remain astronomical, with average pay for CEOs of major companies at $3.8 million, according to Businessweek, the biggest bucks go to those who deliver for shareholders. Why is executive pay increasingly tied to performance? In part, it's a response to shareholder outrage in recent years. It's also a reaction to new Securities and Exchange Commission rules that require companies to detail exactly what top executives are getting paid and why. For the second year, companies are spelling it all out in their proxy statements. Their compensation philosophy, option grants, even a chart of stock performance relative to peers. In fact, last year, some executives whose companies had bad years took salary cuts. Roy Vagelos of Merck, down 11%. And John Ammerman, chief executive of Mattel, took a 41% pay cut. And corporations now have even more incentive to tie pay to performance. The Internal Revenue Service has now capped at $1 million of the corporate deductibility of salaries. For NBC News, I'm Alan Chernoff.
complete with cheerleaders and the school song, Hermantown High School held a pep rally this morning in honor of some of the school's most successful teams, not the football or the hockey team. Because there's always so much emphasis on athletics and because we all seem to tie into that so well, many of us are also wanting students who do well academically and maybe not so well athletically to be given as much appreciation and as much acknowledgement as we can. The math league took second place at a meet last week. They were honored today. The Knowledge Bowl is headed to the state tournament. All three bands and the choir are headed to regionals. Today, the students that belong to these teams were given a much-deserved pat on the back. I think it's great because we work every single day in band and we really work hard. It gave the band an opportunity to play music that the students uh, don't usually hear. They usually hear the pep band. Today we played Wagner this morning for the student body. Isn't that, that's wonderful. Yes, the Hermantown High School got a shot of culture this morning from the wind ensemble. They completed the pep rally with a piece from Wagner. Granted, it wasn't smashing pumpkins or the crash test dummies, but the students seemed to like it. I like it. In Hermantown, Ted Rowlands, News 6. After a brief statement from Duluth Mayor Gary Doty, Sam Brown took questions from reporters this morning concerning his plans to build an outlet mall on Duluth's Bayfront. Earlier this week, Brown announced that regardless of Tuesday's vote, he will build the mall. Today, he reaffirmed that, but also made it clear which way he'd like to see the vote go. The more attractive uh, our facility is, the better, and the, the more interesting and attractive the public facility is, the better for both of us. Brown would like to see a yes vote, which would clear the way for public improvements around the mall, increasing the aesthetics of the area outside and the traffic inside. Opponents to the project believe that public improvements to the Bayfront can be made without the mall. The idea of saying that the only way to save or improve our Bayfront Park by building a shopping center next to it is just bizarre. It's just bizarre to say that. And frankly, in this election, there are only two issues. One is, do Duluthians want to have an outlet mall next to their Bayfront Park? And secondly, do they want to help Sam Brown pay for it? Helping Brown pay for it makes good economic sense to the Duluth Economic and Development Authority. Today, Dita came out and re-emphasized its support for the mall development. The citizens uh, will be deciding the shape of that mall on Tuesday. But now we are confident that we put together the economic development package that's going to work. One point that both sides of this issue agree on is that the Bayfront area has a lot of potential. What they don't agree on is the potential of an outlet mall on the Bayfront. You have a gorgeous area there that would be nice to walk and stroll along a, a nice green park and be able to watch the big ore boats come up to the site, make a right angle turn and go under that bridge. Everybody does want it improved, but we don't want it improved at the cost of ruining it with an outlet mall. In Duluth, Ted Rollins, News 6. It is the ambition of every graduate to get that diploma and land that first well-paying job. After countless hours of study and monies invested, the grad hits the streets willing and hungry. But many have to settle for less than their dreams. You know, I've graduated for almost a year now, and I've got a lot of resumes out. And I'm beginning to think that I maybe should have gone and tried maybe a technical school. Randy Root is busy taking orders at Wendy's. He is a college graduate with a biology degree from UMD. He says the job market in his discipline is very tough. I almost think that I wasted some of my time and money, and it's uh, really unfortunate. I'm disappointed. Many college graduates end up coming here to Jobs and Training, a state agency whose job is to get anyone a job. 
Over 1,500 college graduates are registered here. They utilize a nationwide computer database that lists jobs according to state and profession. Still, the market is tight. Uh, we know that, that through the summer months that retail will pick up, uh, businesses related to tourism will increase. Uh, so there, there will always be opportunities, those opportunities available. Seasonal jobs don't interest college grads like Randy Rude. He has a four-year, $15,000 investment he'd like to cash in on. So I'd like to work in maybe a lab somewhere or maybe somewhere out in the field with uh, wildlife or anything like that. I'd really kind of like to get something outdoors, I guess. But for now, making that cheeseburger will have to do. It'll be okay. I mean, I'm doing okay here, but in all, it's been difficult and really challenging. In Duluth, Chip Wallace, News 6. Fred Briggs for News 6. There is no question that Fort Worth, Texas has a juvenile gang problem. They have been killing each other in record numbers. Police now estimate there are more gang members than cops in this city of a half million people. So community leaders in Fort Worth are trying to do something about the problem with a program called YES, Youth for Education and Success. It's a job training and placement program for kids who could get in trouble if they don't find a job. Kids like James Brown, who says he has turned his life around and wants to go to college someday. I would probably be locked up somewhere or something because they just do so much for you and give you that extra little push of confidence that you need and they let you know that you can do it and reach your goal. Ricky Clark is program coordinator. By taking that four and five dollar hour job, you don't have to worry about the police coming behind you. You don't have to worry about being shot. You don't have to worry about being involved in a game. You don't have to worry about the drive-by shootings. The problem is teenage unemployment, which can run as high as 30 or 40 percent in many inner city neighborhoods. The first phase of this program is job training. The second phase is job placement. Reginald Gates with the Black Chamber of Commerce in Fort Worth says that may be more difficult than training the kids. I have to pick up the phone and I have to call my members and I have to say, these are not, you know, your straight A students. This is what we're dealing with. But do you care enough to make a difference? These people do, and they hope their program will help save lives. Jim Cummins for News 6. The 10th Mountain Division was ready for combat in Somalia. Now, with the military being downsized, soldiers must be ready for civilian life, for a job in the so-called real world. I'll be leaving Fort Drum on 22 May. Fort Drum isn't being closed, but a lot of its soldiers have decided it's a good time to change careers. And the Army's helping them do it. What kind of questions would an employer ask? Anybody? Probably, what's your experience? And the Army helps to prepare resumes that don't look at all that military. What they stress is skills, leadership, and management. You have to take the military skills that you have and put it in the civilian language so that you can sell yourself. Sergeant Carthen did. After 20 years in the Army, she goes to work in September as a supervisor in a South Carolina company. They prepared me that I just knew I was going to get a job. All of this is part of a program mandated by Congress in 1991 to ease the transition to civilian life. A transition Lieutenant Charles Weening will make this week. He and his family, including the two-month-old twins, are moving to New Jersey. Well, do you have a job? Uh, I have an interview uh, on the, uh, with a major New York bank on the 28th. His chances are good. The Army's own survey says almost 90% of those who went through the program got jobs after they became civilians. Hundreds of thousands more still in the military may be forced to make the same transition as the downsizing goes on, but they'll have months of time at full pay to make it. Fred Briggs for News 6, Fort Drum, New York. Enduring lesson of Richard Nixon is that he never gave up being part of the action and passion of his times. He said many times that unless a person could keep, and so 
on behalf of all four former presidents who are here, President Ford, President Carter, President Reagan, President Bush, and on behalf of a grateful nation, we bid farewell to Richard Milhouse Nixon. of New Mexico. I have also been asked to speak on behalf Well, we hope to top well over $1,000, and for selling tickets in, in, the, in the city of Superior, we think that's great because we can help a lot of animals with $1,000. I think that our committees should have the bill written by Memorial Day, and then I think this summer you will have a gigantic debate on the floor of the Senate and in the House, and I believe early fall we will pass a bill. Ever since its closing last June, Lakeside Elementary School has been at the center of controversy. Some residents want the school to remain a school. Others want the property to be sold to real estate developer Mike Edmonds, who would transform Lakeside into affordable housing. Well, I'd like to see it uh, remain a school because if uh, they turn it into apartments, they're going to have three times as many people on that side of the street as they have on this side and they're going to have a bunch of cars there. HRA has a waiting list of over 1,200 families that desperately need affordable housing. Um, we have so many people in our city who pay well over 50% of their income for housing. Both sides of the issue have been circulating petitions and fact sheets. Also on the agenda, the fate of two other schools should be finalized at tonight's meeting, Cobb and Lowell. The only bids for these properties came in from private schools. Board member Brad Bennett says that's competition Duluth can't afford. This is competition in the, in, the, in the greatest form. They don't pay their teachers anywhere near what we have to pay ours by, by uh, uh, union rules and by union contracts. It is our belief that this competition can open up opportunities for both the startup business or the existing business. And those who are considering a new product or service, it's a win-win situation for all of us.